Hello everybody, my name is Femi O.K. Welcome to a brand new series, a Google Hangout series from the organization Women Deliver. Now in the next couple of weeks, you are going to meet young activists, young leaders from around the world, young change makers who are making a difference. Women Deliver started a young leaders program back in 2010. And over the years, they've had more than 400 young leaders who are pretty spectacular. We're going to meet some of them over the next couple of months. We're going to start with Hennessy's Luigi. Hello, Hennessy's Luigi. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. Good. Um, Excellent to see you. When you tell people what you do, what do you tell them? Oh, I tell them that I lead community projects, uh, that I have a feminist perspective, and uh, also I give countdowns to people. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely gets their attention. And you are based in Venezuela usually. In Venezuela, mm -hmm. when you, as a young person, when you, when you have sex education at school, do you have it and what is it like? Okay, uh, the sex education uh, issue in Venezuela is really interesting because we have a really, really good legislation that allows all kids and young people to have uh, comprehensive sexuality education, but the implementation is, you know, it has some uh, barriers and uh, situations that make uh, the access to comprehensive sexuality education hard for young people. So you're going to be very frank in this conversation. You want to take part in the conversation. We're on Google Hangout, but also on Facebook Live mm -hmm. and outofzero.com. So we're going to be speaking very frankly about some very important mm -hmm. issues about uh, sexual and reproductive health, yeah. uh, and also advocacy as well. So when you're mm -hmm. saying that there are challenges in, not just in Venezuela, but also in Latin America about how do you talk to young people about sex, let's be candid. What are you talking about? Okay, uh, a really big challenge uh, is that teachers, uh, they are kind of afraid and they have also really, really uh, big doubts about what they can deliver and what they cannot deliver. And mm -hmm. this, is a, a, this is not saying that the teachers are not well prepared. It's that this uh, comprehensive sexuality education movement is kind of new for them and for us. And if we want to deliver a really good uh, comprehensive sexuality education, we have to uh, train teachers. And it gets us to the, to the situation that some uh, teachers at schools are not well paid and mm -hmm. these are structural economical problems that affect sexuality education. Sure. And this is a way to see the, the problem not, not as an uh, individual issue isolated from the whole social realities of the of the region all right so i'm thinking i mean you you've helped people as young as 10 11 12 mm -hmm. to understand about sex education so what did you learn at that age what did you know what i learned at that age that uh it was prohibited to touch someone mm -hmm. and that uh sexual organs were just for reproduction and I learned that having sex is bad, uh, and pretty much that, that to get pregnant at uh, the adolescency is uh, the worst thing you can, uh, the, things you, you, the worst thing you can get in your life. Mm -hmm. And pretty much that, that was I learned, that I learned at that age. The reason I'm probing about this is not because I'm obsessed, but it's because it was that education or quite limited education that set you off on the path of what you do now. What was it that made you go, I, I want to help young people understand sexual education, reproductive rights better than how I was taught? Okay, it, it is related to the all, all uh, bad decisions you make in, when, when you're a teenager. And I found a, a, a web page, I remember from a, a place called Family Planning Venezuela, Plafam, mm -hmm. uh, in Spanish. And I said that, wait, this is not what I learned, and this is something really different. And uh, these uh, resources they have on the, on the web page made me think a lot about how shameful was the, the, the education I received. And it made me think that, okay, this is 
there must be more to to learn. So I I was really privileged enough to have access to internet and look and read the things, articles, books, and watch videos about uh, comprehensive sexuality education. And at college, I decided to uh, to be more than educate myself and decided to be a volunteer at, at La Femme, at Family Planning Venezuela. So if you're just joining this conversation, you're listening to Hennessy's Luigi. She is a sexual rights and sexual health advocate and she's based in venezuela hashtag gen why not if you want to be part of this conversation online so you volunteered to teach young people um mm -hmm. about sex yes basically. about sex all right give us a couple <laughs> ideas of questions they would ask you okay common question is the i call them am i normal question mm -hmm. is am i normal if I have one boot bigger than the other one. Am I normal if uh, I and like... And Genesis, we can't just leave that boob hanging there. We have to answer that question, okay. okay? Am I normal if I have one boob bigger than the other one? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Because? I have one bigger than the other one and I consider myself pretty normal. <laughs> uh, so do I. Is that TMI? Probably not in this conversation. You can't have too much information. <laughs> what, what else? What other questions did you get? Okay, uh, another question is, uh, am I normal if I don't want to have sex? Mm. Because if, uh, teenage people uh, get a lot of confusing messages that having sex is bad, but all teenagers want to have sex. So if a teenager feels that uh, they don't want to have sex, they feel like, oh, there's most there must be something wrong with me because I'm not that sexual as society expects me to be. And uh, let me see, there's questions about... Um, there's one you sent me and, and I said, send, mm -hmm. me the, send me a question where it would surprise me. Is it okay if me and my girlfriend put names on my penis? <laughs> Somebody actually <laughs> asked you that question. Yes, because... Uh, uh, Part of the methodology of comprehensive sexuality education is that we recognize that people are uh, afraid or embarrassed to think to ask some things. So we put a, a box, and they can put uh, questions in there that are totally anonymous. Mm -hmm. And at the end of uh, of a session or at the beginning of a session, we just uh, answer the questions freely without asking who who made that. What was the reaction you get, the typical reaction you get from a class, say, for, of 10-year-olds or uh, teens after you finish talking to them, quite frankly, about uh, their bodies, their biology, their sexuality? Oh, the, one of the first reactions is that they have more questions. Mm. Because I, I cannot uh, uh, solve, and no one can solve all the doubts in just one session. And they ask a lot where they can find more information or where they can go or uh, something that, that happens uh, a couple of times is when they see that space as a safe space and they tell you that they are victims or of violence or things like that. And that's because you ask for questions anonymously. So sometimes you'll find out little bits of people's lives and they put that information in the question then what do you do with that that's an incredible responsibility you have as a young yeah. advocate what do you do with that information yeah that's a really like like a really great responsibility because the all the protocols with that have to deal with violence involve mm. that the person that's being a victim puts a, a, a like they have to go to the authorities yeah. And but you cannot push them to do that because it can it can uh, you can put them in a in a risky situation. What you can do is okay. I saw that there's a person in this in this classroom that has a problem. So you can go uh, to this place if you need some help, and and if you want to. Uh, uh, look for support, you can go to this place and this place. And I do it when I am leading uh, 
sexuality education sessions, but I'm also a psychologist and I've had the time to, the opportunity to uh, treat these cases in the individual uh, setting. And in that individual setting is where you see that all these social norms and expectations actually affect the life of people. Hello, everybody online on Facebook Live and also on Google Hangout. This is Hedesis Luigi. She's the very first guest on our Women Deliver series. Women Deliver is an organization that is a global advocate for the rights of women and girls around the world. Hashtag Gen Y not to be part of this conversation. You joined if you just did at a very good time. We are about to do a show and tell. <laughs> Hedesis brought props. Now, we've been talking quite okay. frankly. Imagine yeah. what age are you going to pitch this? little recreation of a class. What age should we think of ourselves as, as you show us your props and talk us through a little sex oh, ed class? Okay, L let's imagine that we are talking to uh, teenagers from 11 years old to 14 years old. And what we use at, uh, let's say, family planning, uh, Venezuela, when we are delivering sex education, is to show this lovely model of the, oh, of a vagina, vulva, and a uterus. And when we uh, are showing this, one of the main questions we have is, uh, what's a vulva? And that's really, that's a really interesting question because uh, not a lot of women know that the vulva is the external part of the female genitalia and actually that the vagina is something that is inside and the uterus is an, an internal organ and when we talk about a lot when we talk about uh, female genitalia and anatomy that's a really nice way to introduce the, the subjects like contraception and beyond contraception is know your own body because if we, we tell to people, ah, it's a really great idea that you should start using uh, contraception, but a lot of people don't know what contraception is and why it's important for them to think about why the reasons why they want to start using contraception. Because the, the thing is not that, okay, you're, not, you're a teenager and you need to start using contraceptives. Mm. What did you bring? Did you bring condoms as well? Hennessy's? Hello, Hennessy's. So right now we're mm. with Women Deliver. We're in yeah, a... But I have... But oh, I have yeah, a... yeah. You, you froze there for a moment. Did you bring condoms okay. as well? No, I didn't bring condoms because mm. I really wanted to focus on the... Uh, on the parts of the body first. I think that's a, that's a really great start point for people to know uh, what they, that their bodies and their choices. Also, I have a rubber model of a penis that some people uh, say that, okay, you can show, you cannot show this in the school. And our first reaction is, why cannot show this? It's, it's an anatomical model. Is that if I will talk to you about the brain and I will bring an um, anatomical model of a brain, it's a part of the body, like uh, everything, like every like other part of the body. Mm -hmm. So, and so this is what this is really interesting because people tuning in now, <laughs> we're doing a conversation about sexual health and reproductive rights with Hennessy's Luigi, who is an advocate based in Venezuela. I think people might be a little bit surprised that you're doing this in Venezuela in Latin America because contraception, uh, abortion, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, it's a very hot topic. How do you tackle I don't know, are you changing hearts and minds? Do you have to do that in order to keep young people safe and well and healthy? Oh, I, I, until you put it that way, I never thought that I was changing hearts and minds. But yes, you have to do it. You have to negotiate a lot 
And negoci negotiation is not something that you do only on the UN headquarters or at international events, but with uh, uh, a school staff, you have to talk to them that on the importance of showing this to kids so mm -hmm. you can talk about the parts of a penis sure. or showing this lady to actually get to actually to actually start a conversation with young people and when you're talking with uh, the school staff you say that they are not bad people this is not a a, a matter of we are the good ones that want education for all and they are the bad people that the, the the bad people that are conservative and don't get us. It's a matter of find a common ground and just talk. There's a picture you wanted our audience to see today, and you sent it to us, and it's a picture from the September the twenty eighth day of action for access to safe and legal abortion. We're going to show our viewers this picture. Why did you send this picture? Okay, I send that picture because uh, when we talk about comprehensive sexuality education, we only think about condoms and pills and don't get pregnant. But abortion access, it is also a topic in if we want to deliver a real comprehensive sexuality education. This picture was about uh, a the se September 28th campaign. It was like two years ago, uh, an online campaign where, where they asked us to put pictures online. And what I, are we looking at, Hennessy? I, I see coat hangers. Yes. Uh, and, the, and this is, this is, talk us through why this picture is so powerful. Okay. This picture has four coat hangers with uh, never again uh, words in it in four languages and it says in what language I have to tell you that a code hanger is not a, a, a chirurgical instrument that yeah. is not a medical uh, so it's, it's referencing supply. backstreet abortions which were have reputations for sometimes being used uh, instruments that are not medical instruments being used for a backstreet abortion. Uh, yes. What there was blowback and pushback to you sharing this online personally for you. Yes. Tell us about tell us about um, that. I just put it that online, and a day after, I received a lot of hate mail from anonymous people that said really uh, hurting things for me and. In that moment, I realized that I was doing something more than educate a lot of people, that I was being part of a cause and part of a, of a cause that um, had like some detractors or people that um, are not being that open or they are not so polite to express their opinions. If you are against the right for women to get an abortion or decide over their own bodies, we can have a talk about it. And you uh, uh, show your arguments, I show mine, and we can talk. And that moment I was so afraid that what could happen to me if I do this kind of activism offline in the in, on the streets, for example, if I show up to a place with a with, with a sign like this, what people should do to me, <laughs> and it made me made me think a lot about how people that advocate for the right to abortion are being so exposed every day. When I've had conversations as a journalist about abortion, those are the ones that get the most heated, uh, the most vicious. And I, we never manage at the end of this conversation to get the two sides to see each other's perspective. One side will be here, one side will be here, and they never come together. How do you deal with that? Okay, um, we or I try not to go to the the the, the extremes of the conversation. It's um, it's also about how we. Uh, formulate the question and how we formulate the dialogue. Uh, actually, I'm hearing the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you give us an example of that? 
Yes, um, um, actually I'm here in, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, we had a really great week having a workshop on youth and abortion mm -hmm. access. And if you ask people, are, are you, uh, do you like people to have abortions, something like that? Mm -hmm. It's like a really harsh question for people. And if you approach people with, uh, do you think women should have the right to decide over their own bodies? People might say yes. And, the, and there is when you start talking about voluntary interruption of, of pregnancy and you start showing the different scenarios. Uh, what happens if, uh, what should be the, the, the as, as scenario if this one, women, woman was raped? What is the case if this, if this uh, pregnancy uh, gets the life of that woman in risk? And you start to find the common grounds in there. And you escalate the conversation until, OK, how can this be related to the right to, for women to, to uh, decide? It's not telling that, oh, yeah, everyone should get an abortion. No, it's not, not like that. And even for advocates like us, we prefer the terms like, uh, we are um, a broad choice that you have the choice to do, uh, to, to take the decisions that, that suits most your sure. necessities and context. And he says, you know what I'm hearing here? I'm hearing that you have to be a politician as well. Your advocacy involves politics. Even if you're not political, you can't avoid that because to change how people think about women's rights, women's maternal and health rights and girls' rights, sexual and reproductive rights, Often it's policy, often it's politics that actually makes those changes. So you yes. have to campaign too, right? Yes, totally. You have to be like really political and polite to people. Polite? Not, <laughs> is, polite. That, is that your approach? Is that the, the, does that work? Does polite work in Venezuela? Uh, being polite to people, yes, is, is okay. like your present, how you present. Mm -hmm to the world and right. the politics uh, have to do a lot about uh, have to do a lot with uh, sexuality and how people uh, approach their the, the exercise of, of their own sexuality uh, it, it it is because if you are not comfortable on your own skin we cannot and uh, we cannot expect that citizens can uh, engage themselves in themselves in, uh, um, for example, accountability and transparency uh, movements. Because if I think that, oh, I'm I'm just receiving uh, a gift from, if I don't realize that education is my right. And I see it like, uh, oh, it's something that the school is giving me, and I should be uh, grateful that I have the at least a little bit of education. You cannot take that; that you cannot empower yourself to uh, to ask for better uh, education for high quality programs. And that's the, the importance of comprehensive sex education, that you can feel comfortable on your own skin to recognize yourself as a citizen, and then you uh, can be engaged in advocacy. Because advocacy doesn't have, again, to be just at the UN headquarters or regional events. You can do advocacy and in your community. If where you your advocacy, Hennessy, where, where does your advocacy take you? Where have you been? With your advocacy, uh, with advocacy, I have been yes in, in some events mm -hmm. when when you have the privilege to represent a, a community. I have been in Denmark with the Women Deliver program. I have been in Cartagena, Colombia. That that was a really interesting meeting because uh, Cartagena is. A really nice city but you see the inequalities mm -hmm. in the context uh, I have been 
in the United States. Uh, it has taken me far, but if I'm not on the field, I cannot represent what I don't know. Mm. There's a picture that you shared with us, and you said it's not that professional a picture, <laughs> but I love it. We're going to put that picture up. Okay. It's the young people on stage. Um, and probably taken before the digital age, I suspect. Um, <laughs> so let's have a look at this picture and tell us why this was important because we just wanted to squeeze okay. it in before the yeah. end. Um, that picture for me is, wow, it's a really nice picture because it was the first, uh, uh, like, like a first meeting on sexual and reproductive rights in a town in the outskirts of Caracas. Uh, that, that, that is called Carrizal. Car Carrizal. And this movement started with uh, sexual and reprodu reproductive health sessions at a professional uh, educational center that is for people that uh, finish high school, that they want to uh, be in the professional uh, market but they don't have like the means to go directly to college. And we started these sessions and we see it like normal uh, comprehensive sexuality education, asking questions, answering questions, having real talk about uh, the doubts they had, these uh, young people that, that you see in here. And this project escalated to form a, a municipal network on reproductive health and rights. Mm -hmm. And it, not, it, it involved more people than me. And it, that, that's a really, really important aspect that one people cannot do all the job. It, the, the, the matter of the importance of a coalition is that it's capital. And now these young people are part of this, uh, um, community network that aims to defend and promote sexual health and rights in, in their community. Now, uh, the, the local hospital, the, 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 the town hall is, is engaged to give these uh, people training on comprehensive sexuality education, but also in advocacy that they can recognize themselves, that they can do something for their community. Hennessy's, if people are watching you right now and thinking, I want to be like Hennessy's Luigi, oh. I would love to follow in her footsteps. How would you inspire them? What practical advice would you give them? Uh, engage with your community causes. Uh, get interested in what happens on your community. Uh, something that um, it, it's, I don't want to, to, that this sounds like an advice because I know that learning English is so hard for some people because it costs money and mm -hmm. language learning sometimes is restricted for some privileged people. That uh, to take English as a tool mm -hmm. to uh, communicate what happens in your country and in your reality. Because every, a lot of initiatives are like doing, being done in English and a lot of Latin American people don't have that knowledge. And it's so frustrating that you have amazing advocates and that you have really, really inspiring young people, but the, the, that the language barrier is like hard to overcome. Mm -hmm. And well, yeah, I think that's, that's all that be interested and in, interested and motivated in your local causes. All right. Hennessy, I, I, I feel the frustration of somebody who might have just joined the conversation and thinking, it's over so soon. I, did, I, did I miss the show and tell? Will you show us our props one, one more time? Because I want them to have to go back to the beginning of the tape and watch okay. the whole thing. So show, show the props. This, the prop. Okay, I this will present prop here. this uh, again. This, is, this has been like a the most helpful tool for me to open a conversation. Right. Very good. And then, and then there's one other prop, which I feel like yes. is a bit of a mic drop uh, okay. uh, and show that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be biological and scientific here. All right. Okay. A rubber penis <laughs> okay. to talk about 
anatomy and that can open the door to open to the different ways to be a man and masculinity. Right. Very and, good. Yeah. How does this we do? I, think, I think we just did a little tease at the very end for anyone who just joined okay. to go back to the very beginning of our conversation. Hennessy's Luigi is a sexual reproductive health and rights advocate. She's also a women deliver young leader and the very first special guest on the Generation Why Not conversation series. Hennessy's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for teaching. Yeah, it's been a pleasure for me too and to have this opportunity to uh, Thank talk you. with you and with a lot great. of people online. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Facebook Live. Thank you, Google Hangouts. See you next time.